When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hey everybody, I'm Jared Halverson, this is Unshaken, and I couldn't be more excited about what we get to talk about today, 3 Nephi 17 through 19. When it comes to doctrinal chapters, I have a hard time picking a favorite. King Benjamin, Abinadi, Alma and Amulek, Samuel the Lamanite, Alma to his sons, there are so many incredible doctrinal chapters in the Book of Mormon. But if I had to pick a chapter that was most personally moving because of what takes place there, not necessarily what's taught, but what occurs, It'd be tough to beat 3 Nephi 17. What Jesus does in this chapter is one of the most moving scenes that you'll ever find in Scripture. And one of the most amazing things about it is that it's a bonus chapter. In some ways, it shouldn't have been here. They shouldn't have had this experience, but they did. And because they had that experience, we get to have an experience with them. I love this chapter. But to put this chapter in context, we need to go back and realize just how much I've been talking for the last two weeks. From 3 Nephi 11 through 16, it took me five hours to get through that material. And if you went back and watched all five hours in a row, it would probably be information overload. I get it. But that's the kind of experience that the Nephites had. By the time you get to chapter 15, it's been nonstop from 11 through 16. Christ descending from the heavens, ministering to the Nephites one by one, which would have taken hours and hours and hours for 2,500 people to come and touch the marks in the hands and his feet to thrust their hands into his side. That's an experience that neither party would have wanted to rush. To move on to the Sermon at the Temple, explaining the change from the Law of Moses to the Gospel of Jesus Christ, talking about them as the other sheep and the other, other sheep of the house of Israel. Incredible day, but talk about drinking from the fire hose. I remember the first time I ever got to go to General Conference live. This was back in the old days in the tabernacle. I was a senior in high school. Left LA with my parents, went up to Salt Lake and got to go to conference. My dad had tickets because he was the state president at the time. And I remember we waited in line, even with his tickets, to get in and we made it to the Saturday session. I sat there in the tabernacle so excited to be in the same room as prophets and apostles. And as soon as that session was done, got back in line and waited and got in for the Saturday afternoon session. As soon as that was done, got back in line and dad and I waited to get into the priesthood session. By the end of it, my dad was like, you know, son, I mean, mom's here. I'm sure she would love to be able to go to a conference session as well. I didn't quite get what he was getting at. And so I said, oh, that's totally fine, dad. I should have thought of that. She and I can go tomorrow. I don't think that's quite what he meant, but he was kind and he let mom and I go to the Sunday morning session. And as soon as that one was done, got back in line and dad and I went to the Sunday afternoon session. I was there for all five and I just couldn't get enough of it. Drinking from the fire hose, you bet, but keep it blasting. I'm sure that that's how these people felt, but it can be overwhelming. In their case, and in my case at conference, it wasn't just information overload. In a way, it was inspiration overload. I wanted more, but I couldn't even handle what I'd already received. And that's exactly what's happening here. Look at chapter 17, verse 2. Jesus, ever the observant teacher, says, I perceive that ye are weak. He doesn't mean that negatively. You're, You're human, you're mortal, that you cannot understand all my words, which I am commanded of the Father to speak unto you at this time. This was the Father's lesson plan, and he wanted this teacher to get through the material as overwhelming as it might have been for those students. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever perceived your own weakness? That what the Lord is trying to teach you, what the Father is commanding to be conveyed, is just over your head. For a lot of people, that describes their first experience in the temple, receiving their own endowment. I remember after my brother-in-law, Alan, one of my spiritual heroes, after he went through the temple for the first time and received his own endowment, He shared a scripture from the Doctrine and Covenants that described his experience. Section 78, verse 17 and 18. Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye are little children, 
and ye have not as yet understood how great blessings the Father hath in his own hands and prepared for you, and ye cannot bear all things now. Nevertheless, be of good cheer, for I will lead you along. The kingdom is yours, and the blessings thereof are yours, and the riches of eternity are yours. If the Father is trying to give to us all that he has, then of course it's going to be overwhelming, especially the first time he begins to open those windows of heaven and pour out revelation upon us. I love those verses. You are little children. You just don't get it yet, and that's okay. I will lead you along. As I've often said to my students as they're preparing to receive their own endowment, prepare to be blown away your first time. Because this is a lesson the Lord intends to teach you over and over again throughout your entire life. And for there to be still some revelation you haven't had, some insight that is yet awaiting you on your thousandth time through the temple, then of course the first time is going to be over your head. Of course you're going to be drinking from the fire hose and there's no way to bring it all in. That's okay. You weren't meant to understand everything your first time. You can't bear all things now. That's okay. Be of good cheer. The Lord will lead us along. And that's exactly what he's doing here. He gives them some incredible counsel in verse 3. Important for any of us, anytime we feel overwhelmed by something, a calling we don't think we'll ever grow into, uh, an understanding that we don't think we'll ever fully grasp, the book of Isaiah or Revelation. I mean, there's so many different examples of having this experience. I'm sure you've had it just like I have. But verse 3, there are five pieces of advice the Lord gives them. Therefore, number one, go ye unto your homes. Just pull yourself out of this situation. That's okay. Don't feel like you have to master it all right now or right here. In fact, Elder Bednar has taught going home is always the best step because it's there that you'll fully understand the gospel. Because it's there that you're really living it. So go home after conference. Go home after the temple. Go home after scripture study. Go to a safe place where you can think about these things because that's exactly what he's going to ask them to do. Second step, ponder upon the things which I have said. That's definitely one thing we don't seem to do enough of. We want to learn the gospel through headlines or memes or infographics or 140 characters. Instead of really taking time to think about the things the Lord has taught us, of course it's going to be over our heads. This is divinity speaking to humanity. And as he said, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. How much higher? How about heaven versus earth? Talk about elevation. So of course you're not going to get it the first time. And that's all right. It's the thinking, the pondering that really needs to happen to open mind and heart to a fuller understanding of these things. It would be a pretty elementary gospel if we could just get it all the first time we hear it. As I've said elsewhere, one of the beautiful things about the gospel is that it has the lowest possible floor, but an infinitely high ceiling. A child, a new investigator can walk in on ground level, sing primary songs, understand the basic truths of the gospel. But the most intelligent, scholarly, well-read, well-educated disciple can continue to ascend the staircase and never reach the top. I think it's one of the reasons that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the exception to the rule that higher education tends to lower spirituality. For most religions across the board, the most faithful and active people are typically the less educated. And yet within the Church of Jesus Christ, amazingly, higher educational levels tend to coincide with higher degrees of commitment to the church. It's because that ceiling is so high. The good news is, it means we'll never run out of stairs to ascend. The bad news, if we can call it that, is that as you first start climbing and look up, thinking you have to be at the top by tomorrow, which you don't, that can be overwhelming. So go home, number one, and think, number two. Third step, ask of the Father in my name that ye may understand. I mean, it would be pretty ironic to think we can come to know God without God's help. It's the relationship he wants, not just the understanding of his revelation. So don't be surprised when the professor teaches so deeply when you're in class that you're overwhelmed and confused by it. Because guess what he really wants? He wants you to use his office hours. He wants to get to know you. I feel that as a teacher all the time. I'm teaching large groups, large classes, and I just wish I knew my students better. 
And so when they come in and sit down one-on-one -on -one in my office, I'm in heaven. Not just because we can get deeper into the kinds of things we were talking about in class, but I can get to know them in ways I never would in a classroom setting. You see what the Lord is doing here? I want you to come to know me. But in order for that to happen, you're going to have to come unto me for that kind of knowledge. It's relational, not just revelatory. Ask the Father in my name to understand. That's how true comprehension will come. Fourth step, prepare your minds for the morrow. You didn't see today's class coming, but class is back in session tomorrow. Be better prepared for tomorrow's lesson than you were for today's. Even that second time through the temple is so much different than the first because it's not coming as a surprise to you. I'll give you an example. I hope she'll forgive me for sharing this. My older sister is amazing. She is, always knows what's going on. Half the time because she's in charge of it. She's making it happen. She is a mover and shaker, a go-getter. Don't mess with Kristen. But as wonderful as that strength is, flip the coin, like we talked about in Alma 38, and what's the weakness? Well, if there's ever a time that she doesn't know what's going on, then that's really frustrating for her. Now, luckily for her, that doesn't happen very often. But it did happen the day she received her endowment. I was there. The two of us had just received our mission calls. We would go out practically simultaneously. I beat her by two weeks, which I was grateful for. But there we were in the temple receiving our endowment. And having a similar experience as far as what was taking place on the outside, but very different experiences as far as what was taking place on the inside. You see, neither one of us really knew what was going on. The difference was, I'm used to that. Ignorance and confusion is kind of, hey, second nature to me. That's all right. I'll figure it out later on. My sister, on the other hand, is like, I don't get it, and I don't like that. She's not as used to ignorance as her little brother is. Now, I didn't know any of that at the time. I was just kind of trying to soak it all in and so excited, like, wow, I have stuff to think about and study for the rest of my life. Well, I went home after that first experience, just energized, turned to my scriptures. I want to understand what just happened to me. My sister went home thinking, I don't know if I want to go back. And thankfully, a wise roommate of hers who had had her own experiences in the temple, first feeling weak that she could not understand all that the Father was commanded to teach unto her in his holy house, and yet persevering and enduring, going home and pondering and asking God and preparing. Well, she said to my sister, you got to go back. She said, hey, let's go to the temple. And my sister was like, oh, that sounds great. Thanks for the invite. I'm kind of busy today. Thankfully, that wise roommate saw through that and said, no, seriously, let's go. And again, ah, oh, that's all right. Maybe I've got maybe some other time. No, Kristen, you and I, we're going to the temple. You see the fifth thing, the fifth step that Jesus says, after preparing your minds for the morrow, it's I come unto you again. We got to go back. Let's try this again. And so she dragged my sister to the temple, and my sister had an amazing experience there. It was no longer the unknown. I mean, granted, it wasn't yet understood. That's going to take our entire lifetime, right? But at least it was, okay, I know what's happening next. The temple is the most incredible place of learning you'll ever go. That's what he calls it, right? A house of learning. But God is the teacher, and symbolism is his teaching style. Just like the parables confused a lot of the Jews, the temple confuses a lot of Latter-day Saints. And it doesn't have to be that way. Well, it sort of has to be that way if it's going to, again, last us lessons throughout our entire lifetime. But if we'll simply go home and think and pray and prepare ourselves and then go back, learn more, open yourselves, and continue that process throughout your entire lives. Do the same thing with Scripture when you don't understand it all. Do the same thing with general conference. Do the same thing every time God is trying to teach you. Bringing heaven down to earth is hard. It's one of the things that Brigham Young said he was most impressed with in Joseph Smith, that Joseph seemed to have that ability to translate heavenly things into earthly understanding. Joseph could drink from the fire hose and actually swallow. For the rest of us, these five steps are the things that we need to be following. If you want a simple mnemonic device, turn them all into P words. And what do we do whenever we're overwhelmed by the grandeur of God and the weakness of our own understanding? We pause, we ponder, we pray, we prepare, and we persist. If we will do those things, I testify that we will come to understand the truths of God. We are little children, but God will lead us along. 
and going over my notes for these chapters, I stumbled across an old email that I received 11 years ago this week from an incredible Institute student of mine back in Tennessee named Stephanie Perry, truly a celestial soul. I had given her a, a CD. I made CDs for my students that just had a, as many conference talks from the brethren that I could assemble on one. And she was listening to one that had, I don't know, 60 talks about marriage and family on it. Now that's a tough topic for a lot of young single adults. And she was listening to a talk by Elder Bruce R. McConkie. And she said, Elder McConkie said a phrase that pricked my heart. He said, quote, mortality is a privilege, unquote. Stephanie explained, my heart was so pricked that I stopped the CD and pondered out loud. Mortality? A privilege? I knew then that I had cause to repent because up to that point, I never considered mortality a privilege with all its heartache, sorrow, pain, trials, etc. So I talked with Heavenly Father, here's the prayer part, and asked him to help me learn how to have a better attitude, an apostolic attitude, if you will. And just like Nephi, I got more than I asked for. My testimony of many things was greatly increased. At first, I had little dribbles of experiences, and in those moments I could say, yeah, I guess this is all right. But I did not have my precious experience until Saturday, so a few days later. I set aside the early part of the day with my scriptures and journal. I dedicated a few hours to ponder and meditate and allow the Lord to teach me. I can honestly say that the Lord will match our efforts. When I received dribbles of experiences, it was because I was giving meager effort. However, when I made a greater effort, so did the Lord. I can now add my testimony to Elder McConkie's that it is a privilege to live and experience this mortal life. I was blown away by that email, not only because of the experience that Stephanie had, but because of the effort that led to that experience. It took time. She went home and allowed some time to pass to think about these things, and think about them she did. She prayed about them. She prepared herself, set aside time for the Lord to teach her, and teach her he did. He returned to her to continue teaching because she'd come in for office hours. I hope Stephanie knows how much that email meant to me and having known what she's gone through more recently, a tornado tearing through her home, for example, I hope she still can rest assured that mortality is a privilege. You're awesome, Stephanie. You're doing great things. And knowing Stephanie, if she were here, she'd say, it's not about me. And it really isn't as amazing as she is. All of us can have those experiences. This is the promise that the Lord makes to all. Now, the fact that the Lord ends with that statement, prepare your minds for the morrow because I'm coming to you again. Well, if he's coming again, that means he's leaving in the meantime. And that was a cause for concern for these saints. He mentions that back in verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, everything we just saw from chapter 11 through 16, he looked round about again on the multitude, and he said unto them, Behold, my time is at hand. Now, whenever the Lord says that, he typically means business, that there's something important that's about to occur, and it needs to happen then. When he was sending his apostles to go prepare the upper room for the Last Supper, he tells them, Go to the master of the house and say to him, The master, me, saith, my time is at hand, so prepare this upper room. Or there's a phrase in Luke when Jesus knows that his time is at hand to return to Jerusalem, and it says that he set his face steadfastly to go. Nothing was going to stand in his way. In fact, it's then that Peter says, no, no, don't go because they're going to kill you. And that's when Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. When my time is at hand, in other words, nobody stands in my way. And yet, Notice what happens in 3 Nephi 17. Verse 4, Now I go unto the Father, and also to show myself unto the lost tribes of Israel, those other, other sheep. For they are not lost unto the Father. He knoweth whither he hath taken them. I love what he just said about the Father's personal awareness of his children. We consider them lost. The Father considers them known. We consider them scattered. The Father considers them soon to be gathered. Taken is the word he used. He knoweth whither he hath taken them. This is personal involvement, not just letting things happen from the Assyrians. This is personal knowledge. They are not lost to him. 
Now this sounds like a pretty important assignment now, right? My time is at hand. I've got two appointments next and I'm sorry that I can't stay. But number one, I've got to go to the Father. This is the Son reporting to the Father on what he's been doing. And secondly, heading off to the lost tribes, the other, other sheep that are yet to hear his voice. Now with those two appointments pending, of course the Nephites are going to understand that, yeah, the, the Lord does have to leave. But in verse 5, when Jesus had thus spoken, he cast his eyes round about again on the multitude, and beheld they were in tears, and did look steadfastly upon him, as if they would ask him to tarry a little longer with them. They haven't even asked it. They can't bring themselves to. It's as if. It's as if they would. Remember we hinted at this back in the Sermon at the Temple when Jesus says, if someone would borrow something of you, then turn them not away. Well, they haven't even asked for anything. They didn't ask to borrow. Well, but if they would, if you can discern, notice their needs, well, Jesus is doing exactly that. Just the look in those tear-filled eyes is pleading with him, please don't leave us. In spite of the appointments pending, would just stay a little longer. Have you ever felt that way? Of just wanting to pause time, kind of freeze frame and just stay in the moment? I always feel that during sunsets. It's my favorite time of the day, but they pass so quickly. I felt that way at the end of my five months in Jerusalem. I felt like I'd seen everything there was to see in the old city, and yet I didn't want to stop feeling what I had felt there. Can we just stay? I felt that at the end of my mission. Presidente, can I please extend the mission longer? I don't want to go home. I don't want to stop what I'm doing here. I had a student once, seminary student, about 15 years ago, come into my office at the end of a semester in tears, saying, Brother Alverson, I don't want the semester of seminary to end. And I thought, it's summer vacation, go party. But what she said blew me away. She said, I don't want to go back to the person I used to be. We had been studying the New Testament that year. And coming to know Christ had changed her. And just that feeling of, I don't want to go back to the old me. Can I stay? That's what they were feeling here. And even without having to ask, Jesus perceived that. And in verse 6, said unto them, Behold, my bowels are filled with compassion towards you. He uses similar language at the end of verse 7. My bowels are filled with mercy. Now, I think we understand compassion and mercy, but my bowels, that's kind of strange. My intestines are full of these godly feelings. And yet, it's not that weird after all. Don't we talk about gut feelings or a gut check or feeling things in our guts? In our day, we typically associate emotion with the heart, and that's a great connection as well. But anciently, it was often the bowels where you centered the emotional feelings of things. They often called the bowels, the guts, the seat of affections. Sometimes they even referred to things like the bowels, the kidneys, the liver, most of those things that were sacrificed in the Old Testament. There's some meaning, some symbolism there. They often called them the nobler entrails. Definitely a fancier way of saying the guts. But this nobler entrail lets you know just how deep, how visceral this emotion was for Jesus Christ. I just finished writing a research paper about empathy in the Old Testament. And I was blown away that whether it was the Hebrew of the Old Testament or the Greek of the New Testament, whenever the scriptures talk about compassion or mercy on the level of tender mercies, that it's often associated with words that, that convey this sense of kind of heartfelt but more gut-centered, visceral emotion. The Hebrew word usually translated for mercy or sometimes for compassion comes from the word meaning womb. And sometimes even that word for mercy is translated as womb or bowels. That's how deep it is. It's this wellspring. Again, the womb idea of giving birth to action because of this, this emotion that's so deep within you. Same with the Greek in the New Testament. There's two words that are often used for co conveying compassion. And they both have that sense of inwardness, of depth. In fact, one of them grows out of the word for inward parts. Those nobler entrails I mentioned. Paul takes both of those words and couples them together in Colossians 3 verse 12, where he speaks of the bowels of mercies. Kind of a play on words there. 
Or think about Moses chapter 7, verse 41. When Enoch is trying to wrap his head around the concept of a weeping God, a God that can be so moved with emotion, that has so much personal empathy for his children, that Enoch is blown away. And when Enoch finally gets it, when he shares in God's emotion, just like God shares in ours, where all these em- links of empathy finally converge, this is what Enoch's experience is described. Then Enoch wept and stretched forth his arms, and his heart swelled wide as eternity, and his bowels yearned, and all eternity shook. I know that verse is referring to Enoch, but can you picture Jesus on the cross stretching forth his arms, his heart swelling wide as eternity? Again, doctors who have studied the accounts of the crucifixion, water erupting and not just blood when his side was pierced with the spear, they suggest that Jesus' heart must have ruptured, that he literally died of a broken heart, that his heart swelled wide as eternity. His bowels yearned. Eternity itself shook. Can you think back to 3 Nephi 8? The God of nature suffers. Well, that's happening here as the risen Lord is looking at tear-filled eyes in Nephite multitudes that are just silently wishing. Can I just have more time? Will you tarry a little longer? I don't want today to end. As long as it's been, I want longer. Jesus' bowels, his guts, are yearning for these people. They are filled with mercy. They are filled with compassion. Even that word, come, passion. Come means with. Passion means suffering, feeling deep emotion. And Jesus has just recently, the atonement took place not long ago. And for him to feel that come passion, that con with dissension coming down to be with us and like us, so he would understand us. Remember Alma's words to the people of Gideon back in Alma chapter 7, that he wanted to know according to the flesh, the guts, how his people would suffer. In fact, remember exactly what Alma said? That his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. So no wonder Jesus chooses to stay. His bowels are yearning for people whose suffering and sorrow he recently took upon himself. He puts God Almighty on hold. He lets the lost tribes stay lost a little longer so he can stay with this multitude whose sorrows he feels deeply and personally. Do you remember when the risen Lord, on that Sunday of resurrection itself, sees a weeping Mary outside the tomb? Now, once she recognizes who he is, after he calls her by name, she must have thrown herself at his feet as he says to her, Touch me not. Or in other words, hold me not. Don't keep me here. I have not yet ascended to my Father. Again, he's putting his own Father on hold. Why? Because he sees a weeping woman, a distraught disciple, and he goes to reassure her. Incredible that the first witness of the risen Savior seems to be in one of those extra moments the unplanned, the unintended, but the unavoidable for someone whose bowels are filled with compassion and mercy. He stays with Mary for a time. He lingers longer with these Nephites. The Father is eternal. He'll be willing to wait. The lost tribes have been lost for 700 years. Another few days won't make as big a difference. But for you, another few days will make all the difference. In verse 7, surrounded by these bookends of compassion in 6 and mercy at the end of 7, he says, Have ye any that are sick among you? Bring them hither. Have ye any that are lame or blind or halt or maimed or leprous or that are withered or that are deaf or that are afflicted in any manner? He doesn't want to leave anyone out. Bring them hither 
They can't even bring themselves. They have to be brought by others. Bring them and I will heal them. He understood their suffering more personally and perfectly than he ever had. According to the flesh, as Elder Maxwell has said, it was experiential for him now. Prior to that atoning agony, it had always been cognitive. Alma says that too. The spirit knoweth all things, but Jesus condescended so he would know according to the flesh. And having been broken himself under the weight of agony in Gethsemane, he wants to fix all broken things now. In verse 8 he says, I perceive that ye desire that I should show unto you what I have done unto your brethren at Jerusalem. For I see that your faith is sufficient that I should heal you. This isn't just curiosity or voyeurism. It's not just, oh, well, you did it there. Why don't you do it here? No, I believe this is more of a sense of, oh, if only we had lived there, we would have seen all these incredible things that you've done. Their faith is sufficient to be healed. And his mercy and compassion were more than sufficient. So in verse 9, it came to pass that when he had thus spoken, all the multitude, with one accord, there's full unity here, one accord. They're not, they're not rushing and trying to trample each other to get first in line. No, with one accord, they did go forth with their sick and their afflicted, their lame, their blind, their dumb, with all them that were afflicted in any manner. And he did heal them, every one, as they were brought forth unto him. This is a one-by-one one experience that may even surpass what took place earlier that day, back in chapter 11. And it's not just Jesus' compassion that is so moving here. In verse 9, notice how they're described. Two letters make a huge difference here because it doesn't just mention the sick and the afflicted. It's their sick and their afflicted. Add the I-R and these become possessive pronouns. This is my loved one who is suffering. No wonder I want to bring them to Jesus. Their compassion is moving them. And in fact, their compassion is moving Jesus. To any of you who have been a caregiver, now that applies to all parents, but especially those who are caring for children, for loved ones, for aged parents, those for whom caregiving comes at a great personal cost. I've never seen a better verse in all of Scripture than what Jesus says at the end of verse 7. When Jesus invites them to bring those people, their people, hither, notice the pronouns. They teach a lesson that is profound. Bring them hither, and I will heal them, for I have compassion upon you. You see the difference in those pronouns? I'm going to heal them, third person, apart. I'm not speaking to them. I'm speaking about them. And I will heal them because I have compassion upon you, the people I'm speaking to, the caregivers that are going to have to bring them because they cannot come themselves. I know how heavy it is to have someone, their whole life, their concern just weighing upon you. I know how tiring it is to care for people who cannot fully care for themselves. I know the weight of compassion that comes with that. And I feel it too. Do you have any idea why I fell on my face in Gethsemane? I understand the load of love that caregivers bear. I feel that weight intensely at home with loved ones with special needs mental illness, physical sickness, hard things. And I am so grateful that Jesus has compassion upon the caregivers. They get lost in the shuffle. Our eyes immediately turn to the person that we think is most obviously in need, forgetting about those often silent sufferers who are pained by proxy and not just the weight of responsibility and work that they're constantly bearing. To my fellow caregivers, I pray that verse 7 may be an eternal blessing to you, that the Lord wants to heal them, to bless them, because he has compassion upon you. He knows what you're doing, even if the person you're caring for has no words or no voice or no memory to be able to thank you. Jesus does. 
He feels for you. He feels with you. And it is compassion and mercy that he feels. No wonder, verse 10 says, that they did all, both they who had been healed and they who were whole, both parties, the bringers and the brought, they all bow down at his feet and worship him. As many as could come for the multitude did kiss his feet insomuch that they did bathe his feet with their tears. We could stop right there. And those 10 verses would still be one of the most powerful passages in all of Scripture. 3 Nephi 17 could end and it'd still be one of my favorite chapters of all time. But it doesn't. Jesus is never done. He lingers longer and having blessed all their sick and afflicted, he then turns to their little children. Verse 11, it came to pass that he commanded that their little children should be brought. So they brought their little children, set them down. Picture how little they must be. Set them down upon the ground round about him. And Jesus stood in the midst, and the multitude gave way till they had all been brought unto him. Try to picture this if you can. Again, this concentric circles of compassion and care. With Jesus in the middle, surrounded by the little children, and then another ring on the outside of their parents, their caregivers, everyone else surrounding them. I, I love this mental image, especially as I think of my own children or the children in the church, the youth and young adults, just anyone that needs some extra help being brought to Jesus and then to be surrounded by those that did the bringing. You understand what they're trying to keep out and how they're trying to shepherd them in? I don't think we'd lose so many of our youth or young adults if we tried to embody this image to have all church members just surrounding them in righteousness and love, compassion and concern, pointing them, shepherding them toward Jesus. Verse 13, it came to pass that when they had all been brought and Jesus stood in the midst, he commanded the multitude that they should kneel down upon the ground. And it came to pass that when they had knelt upon the ground, Jesus groaned within himself. That's a surprising verb. I don't know if we see Jesus groan like this elsewhere. And in that groan, he says to the Father, I am troubled because of the wickedness of the people of the house of Israel. Troubled that the innocence all around me here has to be compared, juxtaposed to the wickedness that I have seen in the house of Israel. Wickedness that I just suffered for in Gethsemane. I groan to think of the world that little children have to grow up into. We'll see in 4th Nephi that these particular children had a pretty incredible world to grow up into. But generation after generation, throughout our history, right now, as people are having children and bringing them into the chaotic, crazy world of 2020, I think there's a lot of groaning going on. Concern about what their future will look like. Well, again, follow the example here. Surround them with your spiritual strength. Bring Jesus into the center of their lives. And then your groaning will be matched by his, and he will bless them, as he does here. Years and years and years ago, Henry B. Eyring taught this, about this specific verse. Now for me, at the right moment, I can begin to feel the pain the Savior felt for sins, yours and mine. His groan within himself came after he had paid the price for us, after the atonement. His being troubled was not some abstract grief for our sins and those of the house of Israel. His was real pain, recently felt as he took upon him the sins of the world. I can't experience that, but I can sense it enough to have sorrow for what I have added to it. I can resolve to add no more, and I can feel determination that I will help offer the full blessings of the atonement to as many as I can, because that passage helps me feel, in a small way, what taking upon him the sins of all mankind cost the Savior. You see how this passage moves President Eyring to live as he lives and do what he does? He's one of those bringers, trying to get anyone in the world that will listen to come unto Christ. These can be godly groans. We can be troubled into action. That's what Jacob talked about. Because of faith and great anxiety, it was truly made known unto us what should happen to our people. 
Couple your anxiety for the rising generation with faith in the Lord's compassionate concern for them. And we'll start shepherding, believe me. Verse 15, And then when Jesus had said these words, he himself also knelt upon the earth. And behold, he prayed unto the Father. And the things which he prayed cannot be written. And the multitude did bear record who heard him. Well, unfortunately for us, they're right. What Jesus prayed could not be written, so it hasn't been. I wish we could read those words. But imagine this description of them. Verse 16, this is what they recorded. The eye hath never seen, neither hath the ear heard before, so great and marvelous things as we saw and heard Jesus speak unto the Father. Notice that, not just what they heard, what they saw. When a prayer is not just audible, but visible, some miraculous thing. I don't know what's happening here. They don't tell us but to see and hear Jesus speak unto the Father. 17 continues, No man can speak, neither can there be written by any man, neither can the hearts of men conceive so great and marvelous things as we both saw and heard Jesus speak. More personally, no one can conceive of the joy which filled our souls at the time we heard him pray for us unto the Father. There are some things that simply can't be explained. They can only be experienced. That's why missionaries and members are constantly inviting other people to have those experiences for themselves. I can't take my heart out and put it in your chest. I can't replace your bowels with mine. You have to have these experiences, and they will change you as they've changed us. I love what Paul says to the Corinthians in chapter 2 of his first letter that I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. You see what Paul is saying there? It's better than you could possibly imagine. I can't explain it, and you won't be able to either, but you can experience it for yourself. In my margin, next to 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, I have the word Emily written. That's my wife. She's one of the blessings that God gave to me that was greater than anything I could have imagined. I remember my mom writing her a a thank you card while we were dating. She probably realized, ah, my son, he's going to need all the help he can get. She wrote her a letter, a, a a card, and said in it, I don't know where this thing is going. I don't know if someday you'll end up my daughter in law or just be one of my son's ex girlfriends. But I do want to thank you for proving to my son that the ideals of womanhood really do exist. My wife was proof to a skeptic that it's better than anything I imagined, that I have not seen and ear hath not heard. You can't conceive of the joy that you can feel when you realize just how much the Savior cares for you, how much he's willing to pray for you. If you'll forgive me one quick tangent to the Old Testament, specifically Isaiah chapter 56. I wasn't sure if I should share this, but I feel like I need to, particularly for my brothers and sisters that are in the LGBTQ community. I've had many students over the years come into my office distraught, saying, Brother Halverson, I know the gospel's true, and I'm gay, and I don't know what my life's going to look like. I want to live the gospel. I just don't know how it's going to be. And this is the verse of Scripture that I always share with them. Isaiah 56, verses 3 through 8. I won't read the whole thing here with you, but he talks about strangers and eunuchs. In other words, the marginalized, people that don't feel like they'll ever fit in. I'm a stranger in Israel. Talk about chosen people. I'm not one of them. I'm an outsider, but find myself among you. Or eunuchs, someone who cannot have children. In the Old Testament, when the house of Israel... Everything revolves around the possibility of having seed. It's all about the Abrahamic covenant. It's all focused on posterity. I mean, reread the whole Old Testament with an eye to that, you'll see it everywhere. With the barrenness of Sarah or of Rachel, for example, of Hannah. People just begging, God, please give me seed. Well, a eunuch will never have that blessing, at least in this life. And yet notice the promise that God makes to them, to outsiders to people who feel like I'll never be able to fit in in a family church. Verse 3, Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, 
The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. These are such natural statements for a stranger or a eunuch to make. And the Lord is saying, Don't go there. Do not say that you'll never fit in, you stranger. Do not consider yourself a dry tree, you eunuch. You have a place among us. You've chosen us, and we're choosing you. He says in verse 4, Thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, that choose the things that please me, that take hold of my covenant. These are people who are observing their covenants by sacrifice. These are people who are choosing the Lord against the odds. You see why I would think of my LGBTQ brothers and sisters with this verse? And yet they are striving valiantly to be faithful. And when they start to worry and wonder, I'll never fit in. None of this will work for me. The Lord stops them in their tracks, recognizes all that they're doing to try to be faithful, and then says to them in verse 5, Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls. So this is a temple text. Think of all this in the context of eternity as it is played out in the temple. What will he give them in his house and within his walls? He'll give them a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I'll give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. That was the big concern for ancient Israel. If I have no seed, then my name is cut off in Israel. I'll, I'll never be remembered. My family tree dies. Well, these eunuchs, their family tree never grew. A dry tree was what they were complaining about, worrying over. And yet the Lord is promising them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. But my favorite is that middle phrase. I know you want sons and daughters. I know you want to fit in. I know you want all the blessings you see other people seeming to get so easily. This applies to so many groups of people within the church right now. Notice he doesn't get specific. He doesn't explain exactly what this blessing will be. He doesn't answer every specific question about your situation. He doesn't fill in blanks here. He leaves the blank open. And I've had a lot of students of my own with same-sex attraction say, I prefer it when people don't say, oh, this is how heaven is going to look for you, or this is how it's, what's going to change about you. No, if God has been unclear about this, they tend to prefer that. Don't force your solution upon me. God leaves it vague also. But what he doesn't make vague is the promise of something even better than you can imagine. Better than sons and daughters? What could that possibly be? I don't know. He doesn't tell us. Just like the Nephites there in 3rd Nephi 17, I can't tell you the joy that filled our hearts. I can't tell you what we saw and heard Jesus do as he prayed to the Father. It was inexpressible. It was unimaginable, but unimaginably good. There are times where I wish I could say to my students who are wondering about their place, I wish I could be specific. But in many ways, I'm grateful that I can't be because my description would be beneath what the reality will eventually be. Only the Spirit can convey that superlative. Let the Spirit do just that. That's what these Nephites are trying to express in 3 Nephi 17, 17. Now, one other detail in that verse, he was praying for them, and that's what filled their souls with such joy. I do wonder exactly what that means, for Jesus to pray for you, for him to pray for us. Remember he says that to Peter, to Simon, in a moment of not quite rock-like strength yet, and he says to Simon, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. To have the Lord pray for us? I served a Spanish-speaking mission, and it's hard to translate for because sometimes it's por and sometimes it's para. And when I taught at the MTC, that was always one of the most difficult lessons to try to teach because the missionaries just didn't get it, and half the time, neither did the teachers. There's this nuance between por and para, and both of them can be translated as for. I actually looked up this verse in the Spanish, El Libro de Mormón, wondering which one it would be. Know which one they use? Y nadie puede conceptuar el gozo que llenó nuestras almas cuando lo oímos rogar por nosotros al Padre. No one can conceive of the joy which we felt when he prayed for us, rogar por nosotros. Now there's a lot of nuance in por. 
If any of you native Hispano hablantes want to chime in in the comments, I would love to hear your perspective on this. But there's something about praying por. When we use por, often it's a sense of in place of or in behalf of someone. I wonder if that's part of what Jesus is doing here as well. Consider it this way. It's one thing for Jesus to pray for you, to pray that the Lord will bless you. I, I'm pray, like when we pray for somebody, oh, I'll pray for you. I'm going to ask Heavenly Father to bless you. But often, por in Spanish is used in place of, in behalf of, like an exchange. And I wonder on that side of things if Jesus is also, in addition to what we just described, praying in their behalf. Imagine a congregational prayer, for example. One person is acting as voice on behalf of, por everyone else. And I wonder if that's part of what's taking place too. If you consider that while you are praying, imagine Jesus praying with you, alongside you. Remember we talked about this with the Lord's Prayer back in chapter 12. Our Father. Can you imagine if Jesus were offering the prayer on your behalf? Almost a sense of, Lord, will you speak to the Father about this? Why do you think we pray in the name of Jesus Christ? It is the Lord praying for us. I don't know. I, there's still there's something there that I just want to keep wrestling and grappling with. I want to better understand how does the Lord pray for me? And how can I better pray to the Father in the name of Christ? I guess that's a place for me to go home and ponder and pray and prepare and keep studying. Now in verse 18, it came to pass that when Jesus had made an end of praying unto the Father, he arose. But so great was the joy of the multitude. They were overcome. So was he. When he tells them to get up in 19, he then says in 20, Blessed are ye because of your faith, and now behold, my joy is full. He was groaning in 14 over wickedness. Now he is rejoicing over faith. Honestly, that's one of the things that motivates me to do everything I can to try to build faith among people throughout the world. I do want our faith to be unshaken so that when Jesus returns, that's the question he asks in Luke 18, 8, and it haunts me. It motivates me. He says, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith upon the earth? Here, when Jesus came among them, the answer was yes, and it filled him with joy. Can you imagine our efforts to have a similar experience occur for his sake when he returns? In 21, when he had said these words, he wept. This is the Enoch experience all over again. This is Mary and Martha. This is visceral, gut-filled compassion. He weeps with them. And the multitude bear record of it. It was so shocking to them. They had to write this down. This was a journal entry. He took their little children one by one and blessed them and prayed unto the Father for them. For years, whenever I've read this, I always thought he did that back in verse 13, 14, 15. But no, he gathers them. He groans over them. He begins to pray in 15, but he hasn't blessed them yet. It's as if he's preparing himself. He's praying for them, praying over them. But there's a more direct blessing that comes upon them, starting in verse 21. And having blessed them and prayed unto the Father for them, 22, he weeps again. Honestly, this makes me rethink the way I give priesthood blessings. If I've been too quick to lay hands on head, when I should precede all of that with things like groaning within myself, having a gut check of compassion and mercy, of praying unto the Father, of praying for them, of plumbing the depths of their faith and sharing with them my joy, of weeping with them, of mourning with those that mourn before I strive to comfort those in need of comfort. What a different blessing it would be if that's how I preceded it. Well, what followed the blessing? Verse 23, he speaks unto the multitude and says unto them, Behold your little ones. Look at them. See them for who they are. Look at the lowly. Pay attention to the marginalized. Recognize them for who they are your little ones. And as they looked to behold, they cast their eyes towards heaven, and they saw the heavens open, 
and they saw angels descending out of heaven as it were in the midst of fire. They came down and encircled those little ones about, and they were encircled about with fire, and the angels did minister unto them. And the multitude did see and hear and bear record. They know their record is true. All of them did see and hear, every man for himself, 2,500 of them, men, women, children, having this unforgettable experience. Can you imagine? Can you imagine as a parent seeing this happening for your children? Can you imagine as a child experiencing these things yourselves? The ministering of angels encircled about by fire, the blessing of Christ one by one. Does it get any better than 3 Nephi chapter 17? But talk about a preview of coming attractions, one that we'll have to experience in order to understand. There was a story told of President Spencer W. Kimball, who loved the lowly, who reached out to the marginalized, who was so short himself that he never seemed to look down on anyone. He wanted to lift everyone up to God. He was in Chile for an area conference. Members from four surrounding countries had come together in a stadium that held about 15,000 people. His hosts asked him, after the conference is over, what would you like to do? And he said, eyes full of tears, I would like to see the children. So one of the priesthood leaders announced over the microphone that President Kimball would like to shake the hands or bless each of the children in the stadium. And the people were blown away. How can he have the time to do this or the energy to keep on going? There was a great silence throughout the crowd. And one by one, President Kimball greeted about 2,000 children. He was in tears, shaking their hands, blessing them. The children themselves were incredibly reverent. They looked at him and they were in tears as well. He said, and this is a prophet speaking, that he had never felt a spirit quite like that in all his life. As Jesus would say to his apostles, who didn't think the children needed him, they've already been perfected in Christ. There's no accountability here. What did Jesus say? Suffer them to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. What better depiction than what we just read in chapter 17? Such is the kingdom of heaven. Inexpressible joy. Better than eye has ever seen, better than ear has ever heard, better than you could ever imagine. Joy filling him because of your faith. Joy filling you because of his loving prayers for you offered unto the Father. Seriously, go back through chapter 17 someday and just look at all of the verbs of what Jesus does. In this chapter, Jesus looks and perceives. He beholds and looks steadfastly. He feels compassion. He feels mercy. He perceives. He sees. He heals. He accepts their emotional outpouring, invites them to come closer. He groans. He prays, he weeps, he blesses, he weeps again, and he turns all the attention on these little ones. Behold them, become like them, and you will have experiences with him like they did.